Welcome everybody back to the Zero to Five Million Dollar Podcast, the first recording of 2023. Happy New Year. I hope you had a good time off over the holidays. And you'll notice again, it's me, Ollie here. I'm not with Sean. Uh, he couldn't join us for this recording, but I'm with a stellar, stellar guest. But before we get into that, uh, I'll, I'll complete the rest of Sean's script. This show is brought to you by Order Clothes and Vanilla Soft Company. Now, um, I'm with Mr. LinkedIn. I, I could have... I could have maybe gone a bit further on that, but Richard van der Blom is with me. And to be honest, if you if you do LinkedIn and you want to up your game, if you want to post more, um, get more viewership and engagement, grow your audience, that type of thing, Richard is a really good person to follow. Um, I've never really known somebody who is so up to the minute on the algorithm. And I don't always like to um, to focus too much on it, but truthfully, if, if I don't cater towards it, I, I am literally hurting myself. So Rich is with me. Uh, welcome to the show, Richard. How are you doing? Thank you for having me. I'm, I'm doing fine. Just starting my year and uh, it's going fine so far. Thank you, Ali. Good. Good stuff. Good to have you on. Um, so talk to me about how you got to where you are today. Now you train people, you help them on, on all of their LinkedIn presence. But when did this idea of I'm going to do this as my full time start? Uh, that That's a good question. I st- Well, I... I started this company back in 2010. And before that, I was working as a sales and marketing manager in a training agency. Um, And we worked a lot also with freelancers, entrepreneurs. And what surprised me is that a lot of people, um, they don't feel comfortable doing sales. They don't feel comfortable reaching out to people. But once they are at the meeting, they obviously know what they're talking about. So to make it easier for people to get this initial initial client meeting, to get this first meeting, that was something that I thought like, hey, if I could help people doing that, um, that would be awesome. So I started a company in 2009 and we were focusing on like offline sales capabilities, strengthening people's knowledge about that. And then LinkedIn started to become more and more um, um, you know, known. Uh, and at the moment, 2010, early 2010, there was no other company, at least in Holland, that provided LinkedIn trainings or LinkedIn services. So we took our business model and transferred it to how can LinkedIn use you as an entrepreneur, as a startup, to increase brand awareness, to identify potential clients, and to uh, reach out to them. So that's what we did in 2010. 2010, 13 years ago. That feels a long time ago. How how different was LinkedIn then? What was like the hot thing to do at that point? <laughs> Imagine when I joined LinkedIn in 2005, it was no more than a digital roller deck. So you had your profile, you could connect with people. But for example, there was no feed. There were no company pages. Um, so it was really like digital roller decks. And when we started in 2010, I think... The biggest questions from companies and individuals was, what is it? What is LinkedIn? And should I use it? Yes or no? And this transformed uh, around 2014, 2015 to like, hey, I know what it is, but now I need help to implement this in my sales and marketing strategy. And this again transformed, let's say, three, four years ago to we have been using LinkedIn we have been using LinkedIn in trying to get more brand awareness, more clients. We're not totally happy with the results. How can you help us to improve this? So this is what happened over the past, let's say, 12 to 14 years. Okay, so going into the business side of it rather than the LinkedIn side for a moment, um, who helped you along the way? What were those like key hires or, or people at the very beginning that really steered you on the right path? And you know, for a lot of people that we asked this to, it's a person to take some of the admin away or someone who um, was really good at something they weren't good at. If for me, it's um, uh, I, I need help with the admin stuff quite often. So a project manager would be my one. Uh, what was yep. the person or, or thing that you did early on? I, I think there were two people that, that made a difference. First of all, when I started the company 2010, I did it with a companion, Vincent. And um, there was a lot of synergy because he was the creative mind of the two of us. So he came up with new types of trainings, new types of ideas. And I am more like, okay, give me the idea and I make sure that it will work. So I'm I'm not the most creative person, but if I give you an idea, I'll make sure we can implement it. So 
to have someone at your side that has uh, different competences, different capabilities, for me, uh, was uh, a more easy way to grow the business. And then there is um, actually my last boss when I still was working for a company. Uh, I remember I had a lunch with him and we were doing all kinds of things. We were doing like LinkedIn, we were doing Facebook, Twitter and all kinds of services. And he said, you need to focus because people like generalists, but they will pay specialists. And that was when in 2015 I decided, and this was also the end of the um, collaboration with the companion. This was where I decided, okay, we really need to become the 100% focused LinkedIn uh, agency. So that focus, get rid of all the other things, uh, also created a path to growth. Definitely. Yeah, I've I've seen that in practice. And there's so many times when you see people who are kind of trying to touch on too many topics and they don't really go far into any of them. And then when you just eliminate three other topics, like Facebook is arguably a bigger topic than LinkedIn to try and cover in service yep. and in content and everything else, you can yep. go way deeper into that. So I'm not surprised at all that you said that and that it worked. So when was the moment when you knew we're on to something like that choice or this product or this service or this way of marketing ourselves is really working and we're we're going to go bigger at the moment? Well, it, it's... it's uh... It's really strange to to say, like, like first of all, we had a focus in 2015. Uh, in 2018, we made a decision to stop providing single trainings because they didn't brought the results we were hoping for. Because I guess with all kinds of tools, it's not about the tool. It's about implementing the tools in your daily life, in your daily routine. So um, people are going to make use of LinkedIn successfully if they implement their LinkedIn activities in their daily, weekly, monthly routines, whether it's sales or marketing or recruitment. And just providing a single training will not do the job because we need to change the way how uh, people look at LinkedIn. We need to change the attitude. So in 2018, we said, okay, if you're looking for a single training, we're not a company. We have programs which go from three trainings to now 12 trainings. And we want to guide you into this process uh, and to make sure that you know LinkedIn gets the place it deserves in your sales and marketing strategy. So that was the first thing. And then obviously we were all struck by the pandemic 2020. And that's when a lot of companies realized and they were forced to do all the trainings online. And that brought a whole new dimension to our company because certain, from, from being a company that provided 90% of the trainings on site, to being a company that was like 100% remotely, it gave us access to literally the whole world because we provide an English training so we could go like all over the world. Um, so again, we revamped our training programs. We made them more snackable, like 60, 90 minute sessions. We did a lot of like online preparation, a lot of online coaching. And that really took off because pre-pandemic, we were at five people and we are currently with 15 people. It's funny you say that. Um, several years before the pandemic, I, I did some in-person trainings for social media usage for like marketing teams, and um, every client would always say, "Yeah, come to the office. We'll uh, we'll put some food exactly. on, all that stuff." Every time, exactly. And we always found like no problem. You know, it's a day out. We'll, we'll get yeah. out and do it. It's it's expense as well. Like we don't have to pay for the travel, um, and it's nice to shake hands always. You know, see everybody. Yep. But the content that really stuck was when we did it digitally for whatever reason, and we always wanted to do it that way, A, you know, because we want the value to stick, but also yep. it saves, you know, getting up earlier and getting on the train if we don't have to, much as we do love to meet the clients and you do have to do that every now and then, we would prefer to do it, especially if it's a lot of times in a week. You don't want to be on a plane every day. And it worked better, but the client never wanted that. They always wanted in person, which is kind of strange. But um, it's funny that Ollie, you said I, that. I remember, I remember 2017, 2018, I traveled to Marlow in the UK by plane to provide a day training to a communications company. And they had people from Scotland, Wales, Ireland, and all parts of the UK coming to the office to have a day training on LinkedIn, where you know the after lunch dip is killing you have a full morning of new insights. You get lunch, and after the lunch, like your sponge is like really like full. So the efficiency of the training, and and 
is, is far less than doing it in snackable multiple times online. But also, uh, you know, the costs of bringing everybody to the office, the travel costs, the time you lose. And when I look back at pre-pandemic, I also, I was a very strong believer ambassador of on-site training. But I, 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 I do see still the benefits of sometimes meeting your clients and be there with the people you train. But online, like you said, it sticks more and it is, it's, it's, it's more effective, far more effective. I think that's because like right now I'm, I'm at my house. I haven't had to do anything out of the ordinary. If I've come in from Scotland down to the office, I've had like a flight or a long train. I've got a hotel. I've, where am I eating? Um, what have I got to do like laundry wise? Where's my bag? Have I called home? Like there's so many of these things going on in my yeah. brain. My mental capacity is way down. Whereas at yeah. home, I'm like 100%. Everything's normal. I can, I can consume a lot more and, and probably retain it a lot easier but there we go so um so i want to skip forward a little bit um you produce these reports and uh, you know insights analysis into what's going on at linkedin all the time um before we get into that and what's kind of current for today um you're very very regular with your posting which i think is a, a, a good thing for most people across the board there's whether you have to ramp to it or not is another thing but to be posting very regularly once a day or so is uh, mm-hmm. is never going to be a bad thing what kind of support do you have in the background? So for me here uh, at this company, I'm, I'm supported. We have people who can design. We have video. We have all sorts of things which can help me. Um, of course, I need to come up with an idea. Otherwise, it just doesn't happen. Um, you know, We can't expect everyone to just create stuff all the time for us. But um, I have support. Not everybody does have that. So I'm interested in, in what are you doing and, and who supports you and what kind of team is around you to make your posting consistent and make sure it happens all the time yeah that, that's an excellent question and i i am aware that not many of us have support uh until two years ago everything i published came <laughs> uh, only by me you know i wrote the post i need to look for an image um i started two years ago with an external agency that created my uh, carousel posts when like carousel posts started to take off and um, at the moment uh, I have someone in my team who is responsible for all the visual content so basically I write the content I send it over to her and she produces the carousel or she creates an infographic we also have a guy in our team who is doing video content um, so he was last month he came to Valencia and we created uh, 25 videos that we're going to publish like in the next six months. So at this moment, I do have a team around me um, that helps me not in writing the topics or writing the content, but at least in like making them visually more uh, impressive and more engaging. Um, and one of my advises to people who can afford this kind of help is always like okay if you're good in just the raw content but it takes you so much time to create your own visuals or a carousel you know outsource it find someone uh, like yeah like that's me all (laughs) over i have the idea and then when i try to make it look somewhat professional in any way even zero out of ten hours hours i can't do it no, but, but, but and, and, you know, it's easy to look at the cost and say, no, but that's 100 quid I lose. But in the meantime that you are struggling three hours with Canva or Photoshop, or whatever you're using, you can do so many other things, focus on the things you're good at. Um, and for me, that has turned out like a, really an accelerator of everything I do on LinkedIn. Yeah. So, so you have a person who can do the graphical and, and do you do video yeah. occasionally as well? Yeah, just occasionally. I haven't done video much last year. And um, in our team, we have a video guy who makes videos actually for our clients. And he reached out to me and said, Richard, like you have all the things like the carousel, the repos, you don't have video. So he offered to come over to Valencia. We did uh, 25 videos, less than one and a half minutes. Um, I've published two now, uh, and but they're enough for the upcoming four or five months. Nice. So I, I was going to ask, what's your routine for pre-creation? Um, clearly, you're you're setting aside some time to write, and then you pass um, that on to to the person on your team who makes your carousels. Um, and obviously, every, the video every, needs that. But what what else do you do? Um, every Friday in the afternoon, I look at next week, and I tend to post 
five, six, maybe seven times a week. It's not that I post every day. Sometimes in a weekend, I only post once and sometimes I forget to post. Uh, first of all, I don't schedule anything. So I need to be present because otherwise nothing will be posted. But on a Friday, I tend to look to next week and then I have like uh, uh, like a content system. And then I say, okay, on Monday, I want to have a carousel that's aimed at, for example, social selling. Then on Tuesday, I want to have a post that is aimed at our target audience marketing. Then on Wednesday, I want to have whatever, a, a poll. So I'm on Friday, I look what kind of content I want to publish next week. And then the next question, do I already have the content or does somebody need to create it? And then I like set my emails like, okay, I need this type of carousel. I need this kind of input. And then that's more or less the process. It's very pragmatic. Okay, so you're never too far out. You're never nope. a month scheduled ahead. You're always kind of looking nope. at what worked, nope. what didn't, what have I missed out on a little bit, a new topic come up, and then we're working ahead a week's loo time, right? Mind you, we do have a content calendar. We do have our pillars. You know, We have pillars like personal content, thought leadership content, event content. So for example, I'm going to uh, Jordan in March to speak on a masterclass in Amman. So... I know that two weeks before I'm going to make a post when I'm traveling, I'm going to make a post during the masterclass. And after that, I'm going to make a post with my impression, share some pictures. So I know that if we have an event, I have four moments, four days that I can speak about the event. And I know that if we have a new report coming out that we will do about five to eight posts. So the framework is there, but what I'm going to post next week, I decide on the Friday before. Right. Okay. Yeah. So you do have to know what's coming and then you can break out certain things from that. That almost exactly. takes away a bit of pressure of having to create. But then for the rest of the time where there isn't an event, there isn't a report, you're you're going through your ICPs, you're going through different, um, for, for example, right now, you can't go on Twitter or LinkedIn without seeing chat GHP or whatever it's called. Yeah. So yeah, you yeah. might have done one about that because you've seen it and you've gone, right, next week, we'll do a carousel on that. Exactly, exactly. And I think that's also one of the strengths of a good content strategy because you need to be as flexible as possible because if something comes up, like you mentioned, chat GPT, you need to be there and you need to say to your target audience, okay, we've, we've examined it and these are, for example, the three tips how you can use this new tool to create content just like that so i like to be playing short on the ball very pragmatic but i do know like in general what kind of fillers you mentioned icps i have and sometimes if we're out of inspiration then we just look back on one of the best performing posts of let's say the last 12 months and we just repurpose the same post that's a big one uh, i've been called out for that someone called out maybe i was a bit too close to the original but they uh they said, I feel like you've posted something like that before, but it's one of my top performing things. So what's the harm in reusing it if I didn't have an idea for that day? But anyways, um, so Richard, we're coming up to time. I've got a couple of things I want to ask you. Um, yeah. Give us three or four things that people are doing, not necessarily wrong, but isn't the optimal thing to be doing on their LinkedIn, whether it be they're, they're posting um, static text every single time. That's me. Or uh, that you know all of those things. There's plenty of little things which can take away from your performance. So what what comes to mind? Uh, first things first, especially people working in bigger companies, not being authentic or giving your profile to the marketing and comms department. Okay, they decide which banner you have. They decide that your picture needs to be this. They decide what your headline should say. It's not about that. Whatever business you are in, LinkedIn is a people-to-people -people platform. So be authentic in, in how you position yourself. That's the first one. Second, uh, a lack of engagement strategy. We all know that there's not even 5% of 900 million members that publish content. But publishing content alone will not do the job. I think 2023 will be the year that even your engagement strategy might be even more important than your content strategy itself. So go out there, make room in your agenda, 15 minutes a day to like comment on insightful, relevant posts based on your topic and get um, get the eyes on your comments so people will start seeing you as the trusted advisor you are. So engagement strategy is very important. And then I think proactivity is also very important. It, it, it might be an open door, but 
proactively means like if you know who are your who is your target audience try to set yourself a goal like say like okay every week i'm going to invite 20 25 new potential clients or people that are in some way very uh, helpful to my mission or my brand and try to expand your network with the, uh, with the, with the right people instead of only accepting when people are inviting you I might have to ask you about the engagement strategy in a moment, but um, next question just to rattle through. Um, what are three or four things that the very best or the most successful creators right now are doing? So it could be the types of posts according to the new algorithm report that you have or, or those types of things. Well, well, we all have seen that carousel posts have blown up. You know, It's like a lot of people are creating carousel posts and the design is getting better and better. I, I myself, I've seen carousel posts that like, I love the way how they look, but when I dive into the content, the content is not that insightful. So um, I see a lot of content creators, they use carousels. My tip would be it needs to be go hand in hand with the message you want to have because a shitty message with a nicely designed carousel is still a shitty message. But carousel posts, definitely. I see a lot of personal stories. Well, we have 50% of the people on LinkedIn who, li- who like that. And we have 50% of the people who think LinkedIn looks more and more like Facebook. For me, it's all about authenticity. So if I have a personal story from my own experience, I definitely am going to share it. But I will never borrow your personal story or borrow a quote for somebody else and use it as my own personal story because that's not going to work. Um, and another good thing I see a lot of people do is community building. I think that's also key in 2023. I see more and more content creators building communities, whether they are paid or not, but make sure that people are getting attached to you and they keep coming back to you for like uh, the insights you provide. Love the idea about the balance of personal stuff. Um, if you posted about your trip to Oman, I couldn't copy it because I haven't been there, but um, I recently bought a house. I posted about that. Um, I didn't do a selfie. I'm not big on that. I, I, I yeah. find it just, <laughs> just takes over my feed. But, you know, big life event for me, so I'm posting it. You're following me, and that's part of me. And my work was a big part of how I got to buy it. So that, yes. Um, I went for a walk, and I saw a duck in the in the water. No, but that's just me. Other people might do that, but... No, okay, that, that, that's also me. That's also me. So when people say, what's your definition of personal stories? Well, first of all, everybody needs to have his or her own definition. But for me, there always needs to be a little, a little element that is attached to also the business or your business life you're having so for example my most successful post last year was about my my gardener who is a 73 year old spanish uh uh uh, man but the title of the post was meet joaquin the best social seller you will ever find. And the post was how he came up to me, how he offered his services. So it was a real life story, but it was very relevant for like all the salespeople that are following me. Yeah, or something happened in the team, which is remark worthy, that type of thing. Yeah. Um, okay, last one. And then uh, then we'll have to make, um, then we'll have to wrap up, Richard. I post pretty much every day. Um, I try and do some video occasionally. We have podcasts like this and, and that's always something I could post about. I've tried um, various series, so I've done um, marketing pet peeves, as was kind of funny, or um, I wrote down a list of tactics that I use in my marketing, like uh, how to promote a podcast or styles of podcast, any of those things. Um, they seem to do okay. Um, I've yet to find liftoff uh, or like significant growth of any kind. I'm, I'm not assessed by the likes at all, but um, you hear things like, you know, post every day for six months or a year, and then you could see if you're doing well, some growth you're not going to just post three times and go um what do you think based on that i I should do differently or stop doing or or try out well you said a lot because the advice of post every day for six consecutive months and you will take off on linkedin is not true because again if you post the wrong content if it's not resonating with your target audience nothing will happen so If we talk about frequency, three, four times a week might also do the job as long as your content is relevant. Um, What I always advise to people is try to find your sweet spot. 
in terms of frequency and in terms of what topics resonate with your audience and what topics do not resonate. So for example, I also have a list of 20 peers, people more or less in the same business. I follow what they post. I might even engage with a post if I think they are like awesome posts, but I also have a look on their engagement. And if I see that three, four of them are posting about a specific topic which gets a lot of engagement, then I know for sure if I haven't done it until that time, I need to create my own vision, my own post about that topic. Um, so it's all about testing. And we were at the beginning of the year 2023. So it's all about testing, like, okay, what types of posts, what types of formats, what types of topics are resonating with my audience? Do more of them. And if it doesn't resonate, you don't get a lot of response, do less of them. It's like adapting to what your audience is responding to quick follow up on that um does your like makeup of your connections make a big difference in that so for example we sell to salespeople. i'm yep. a marketer i have yep. a bit of both if i was to talk about writing a cold email which which i do quite a lot um that seems to work i think i have a lot of salespeople in my, in my network i don't have yep. as many marketers but i do marketing so if i post about that it doesn't seem to go as far should I potentially connect with and engage with more marketers to, to even that up? Or is it more like focus one way well, or the other, do you think? Well, it, it is true that the engagement you are getting just after publishing, so like exactly in the first, let's say, 90 minutes, is very important. And the first people in this are going to show your post to are your connections. So if you have uh, your connections who are not aligned with a the topic, then your post will not take off, which in the end will not give the same results. One of the things I found that is very helpful in getting more reach is get people to ring your bell as much as possible. Because if they ring your bell, and it's still a shame that LinkedIn will not notify you when somebody has rung your bell or doesn't provide you with a list, but I know that I have hundreds of people because they, 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 they told me in a direct message or they told me in a comment like, okay, I just rang your bell. Um, and I've seen now that if I publish... Like instantly within three minutes, I have like 60 likes, 20 comments in three minutes. And that brings my post to also to my target audience who are not yet connected with me. So for you, getting more people to ring your bell, kickstart your post, which brings your post to a second and third degree. And then it will resonate with the people who uh, like the topic. So that would be my advice. Great call out. Thank you for that. I, I think... They should make that readable. You should know who has done that, but maybe oh, yeah. they will. Awesome insights. Yeah. All right, Richard, thanks very much for your time. This has been awesome. Um, before you go, I want to make sure people know where they can follow you. I think it's pretty obvious, but um, are you anywhere apart from LinkedIn? <laughs> no, actually, no. No, if they want to follow me, they can go to LinkedIn, Richard Van der Blom, have a look at my profile, connect with me, follow me, ring my bell. And uh, if they have any questions, just send me a DM and I will respond. And mine too, if you if you see me on LinkedIn Live or anything else, that that's a good thing to do. All right, well, Richard, thanks very much. Um, like I said, this was great fun. Um, plenty for me to go and think about and try out. Hopefully the audience enjoyed it too. Um, and with that, yeah. end of the show, folks. Um, leave us a five-star review if you enjoyed the show. Like, subscribe, follow wherever you're listening. And we'll see you next time. Thanks, guys.